Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is a series of 56 short lectures, they're about 20 minutes each, introducing concepts of art for first year art students. There's a series of 28 lectures on common concepts in art instruction. And then there's another series of 28 lectures on themes in art history. I'm going to skip this page because it's a little preface for teachers. So to introduce the lectures. The basic idea is this, that in smaller art departments and in liberal arts colleges and two-year colleges and community colleges, the first year for art students usually has these two components. First there are studio classes and then they're accompanied by something that's usually called art appreciation. And that on the right, that's an example of a, of a textbook of art appreciation. There are like 20 or 30 of these that are currently in print. Art appreciation combines concepts and theories of art with basics of art history and usually uh, basics of technique, usually painting and drawing. On the other hand, larger art schools like the School of the Art Institute, art departments in universities and art academies teach the first year more or less this way. You have a studio component, which at SAIC is called Contemporary Practices. Then you have an art history survey. And that means that concepts and theories aren't required at all. Instead, they're scattered through a number of different upper level classes. So here at the School of the Art Institute, we have a 2000 level concepts of art class. And there are a couple of dozen classes uh, in an average year that are about art theory and concepts in departments like liberal arts, art history, and visual and critical studies. So like other large art institutes, art institutions, the School of the Art Institute doesn't teach concepts of art in any systematic way. But art is more complicated than it ever has been. And there are more theories and concepts of art than there were before, say, 2000. There were more in 2000 than there were in 1960 and so on. The numbers of concepts and isms and theories and styles and problems uh, and problematics uh, in art in the art world is increasing exponentially. The School of the Art Institute is one of the world's leading art schools. So the idea of these lectures is to raise the bar for art education. By the end of these lectures, you'll have a foundation in art concepts that's equivalent to what some schools would expect at the MFA level. So this is much more advanced than what's usually taught in the first year. Uh, but we figured that it would be a good experiment to try to raise the level of art education across the board. The idea is that after you hear these lectures, you will be part, you can be part of the current conversations on art of all kinds, and you'll be able to move with confidence from one kind of practice to another. You could think of these lectures as a buffet or a dictionary or a glossary. Like a buffet, you can pick and choose what you want and leave the rest on the table. Or like a dictionary or a glossary, the lectures are meant as a resource. So when you hear words like semiotics or phenomenology, you can look them up in these lectures. From a teacher's point of view, these lectures are independent of each other. They can be assigned independently. Uh, or from a student's point of view, you can look them up one by one whenever you want. But the concepts lectures and the history lectures are also in a kind of order. So they more or less make sense. There are, there are continuities between them. So you can also um, listen to them in order. But each lecture is independent. Most artists in most cultures didn't need to study theories or concepts to guide their work. The last hundred or so years are historically unusual in that sense. We're not in a normal situation in relation to art history of other uh, time periods. But even in contemporary practice, a number of artists don't read art criticism, art history, or art theory. Whether or not you need these concepts depends on the kind of work you do and where you're going in life, where you want your work to go, and who might see your work. Some parts of the art market definitely use very little art theory or criticism. But other parts have unexpectedly high requirements uh, for conceptual work, for example, in design. So there is no single answer about whether or not theory or problems or concepts of the kind that I'm going to be talking about are good for your work or not. Um, that's why it's useful, I think, to think of this as a kind of a reference um, rather than something that you would need 
you're not going to need C1 through C14. You can see all of those, um, all of those topics, for example, in your work would be very unlikely you'd need them all. After every lecture, you can ask yourself, can I use these concepts to understand my own work? Is there any connection between them and what I'm learning in the studio? At the end of the concepts lecture series in C28, we'll consider the reasons why you might want to reject theories altogether. As you can see there, the title of lecture C28 is Should You Learn Art Theories? You can work intuitively, of course. Uh, most artists in most historical periods have. Um, and then we'll also consider, of course, the reasons why you might want to learn theory. The same thing uh, with the history lectures. At the end of the history lectures in uh, lecture 28 and also a couple times along the way, I'm going to raise the question of whether or not art history is relevant, whether or not it's useful, whether or not it's a good idea to uh, assign, have it assigned and required at all, and how it might be connected to art practice. So I'm keeping my own books out of these lectures, but just for full disclosure, I think it might be helpful to say that I'm not convinced that learning concepts, theories, and history makes you a better artist. I can think of a number of reasons why concepts and theories and art history can make you a worse artist. I don't think it's possible to teach art in any intentional or systematic way. So I wrote this book, <laughs> Once Upon a Time, which um, got me in trouble with the dean that we had because she said that people who teach in art schools can't write books like that. But you can learn a tremendous amount in art school. It's just that I don't uh, think that it's possible to claim that anyone knows how to teach art or how to learn art. So that's just a kind of full disclosure thing. I'm a skeptic on all of the issues that I'm going to be raising. On the other hand, there are a couple of practical reasons why it's a good idea to study concepts of art and problems related to art history. First of all, it's empowering to know what's out there and what you might use. And second, these concepts and problems in history, they form a kind of shared language of art in the 21st century. And in this way, everyone in your year can share the same words and problems. I have a couple slides here to end about uh, reference, reference works. There are no bibliographies or hyperlinks on any of these slides. And there's no list of references at the end of the slides either. If you want more information on any of the subjects that come up here, I've made sure that there's enough information on each slide so you can find what you want if you use the right search string. So if you're interested in any of these topics, just use the proper nouns and whatever technical terms there are as a Google search string and you'll find uh, what you're looking for. There are three common reference works that I use a lot and I'm gonna, I recommend them when you're working on your own. And I'm just gonna look at those three one after another because they come up in the lectures. First of all, the Oxford English Dictionary, which you see a screenshot of on the left. It's by far the best English dictionary. It's the, it's the historical English dictionary. You can see maybe in the small print at the bottom there, the Oxford English Dictionary gives you the history of the uses of words, not just the definitions and the etymologies and so on. So this is available online. You could ask at the library and you'll see screenshots like this that I use in different times um, in these lectures. Second reference work that I'll be using a lot is JSTOR. That's an enormous database of uh, full text scholarly articles in a lot of fields. It's the easiest way to get dependable information on a lot of subjects. It's the next best thing. Well, it's the, it's the thing to do instead of Wikipedia. I was gonna say next best to Wikipedia, but really should skip Wikipedia whenever you can, especially on subject having to do with art and philosophy. Um, JSTOR is quite good and you can access it again through the library. And the third is something called Grove Art Online, also called Oxford Art Online. That's the world's biggest encyclopedia of art. They say it was written by 7,600 historians. Anyway, you can also get that through the library. I'm gonna say a little bit here also about the difficulty of some of these lectures. Most of these lectures are straightforward because they're meant as references um, and none of them require any preparation or outside reading, but a couple of them are conceptually challenging. Usually the main theorists who are used uh, in art writing, people like Lacan, Derrida, Foucault, Barthes, Butler, Hegel, usually people like that are taught to undergraduates using summaries or introductory texts like what you see on the left there. But 
in these lectures, we're going to sometimes read small portions of the actual texts written by those people. So what you see there on the left is an, is an essay that written by the psychoanalyst uh, Lacan, which is usually introduced using books like the one on the previous screen. These actual texts are, are called, um, in scholarly terms, they're called primary texts. And we're also going to use professional scholarly literature, secondary texts like JSTOR, for example, instead of summaries and introductions. The idea is to go directly to the source because otherwise I think that um, the, these concepts can sometimes remain mysterious because you can never, you never really know exactly what the author said and this way you can see for yourself why people say they're difficult and also the way that they thought. And I just, incidentally, whenever you see text like this on screen, um, I'm not expecting that you would read small print. Um, the idea is so that you can see that what the original looks like sometimes and also I make sure that the titles are large enough so that you can write them down. In this case, if you wanted to find that essay, you could write down the, the title and then you could search it and it's online. Okay, so on to the first lecture.